I think especially today, we really have to pray hard that the Holy Spirit, God, will burn within us. Otherwise, everybody will freeze to death in this place. <laughs> <laughs> so cold in here. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> I need Holy Spirit, God, to burn like a fire. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, what an awesome worship. Make us brave, Lord. Let us walk on water. Let us give testimony like Pastor Ross daily basis, how your spirit touches many who are seeking you. Holy Spirit, God, come and manifest yourself. We'd like to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. You know, of all the apostles, and I don't want to have a favorite, but I like Peter. I don't know about you. Because his goofiness and his kind of craziness and making all kinds of mistakes. And, you know, um, I know some of you could identify like John, quiet, loving, caring, counselor type, like my wife. But I feel more in tune with what, who Peter is. So when I read a story about Peter and the gospel talks about a lot of the mistakes he makes. And, and one in particular, you know that story in, where in Matthew, uh, Jesus showed himself as you know, a great miracle worker and, and just fed 5,000 men. You know that story, right? And he said, well, you give them something to eat. He said, Lord, we have nothing. This is open field. How can we buy enough food, right? He said, well, what do you have? And Andrew brings little boys lunch, five bread, two fish, and he blesses it, right? Five bread, two fish. There are 5,000 hungry men. That's a song I wrote many years ago. <laughs> five, br five bread, two fish, what can I do? Oh, this is so little, oh, this is so small. But let's give it on to the Lord. He can do. There should be some clapping and <laughs> cheering. And, wow. <laughs> right? Five bread, two fish. And, and Jesus says, well, gather up all the leftover food. And 12 disciples brought 12 baskets full of food, leftovers. And the word basket used in that text is the basket that they used to bring Apostle Paul down from the wall. So it wasn't a small basket. It wasn't, you know, shopping bag. It was a huge basket. A person, a grown man can go in. So 12 basket full of, I mean, so these apostles like high five each other. Man, you see what our teacher can do? You know what? We get persecuted, we're treated bad, and we're known as nobody. But man, we, we are with this master. He's a cool dude. He could heal people. He could multiply food. And everybody's now talking about, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the political king that we need. Can you imagine the consequence of someone healing people, someone multiplying food? Maybe finally we could get out of this Roman Empire ruling. And, there's a, and then they are talking, well, if he becomes the, the king, then who's going to stand next to him, right side and left side? And, and Peter was certain that he would be the one. He was certain. Like, I love Jesus most, man. You know, he looks at me differently than you guys, competing and comparing. And after feeding of the multitude, he says, I need to go to the mountain and pray. Why don't you take the boat and meet me in the other side? So they did. But when it reached 3 AM, the wind started blowing. And Peter knows this. He's a fisherman. He's fished there all his life. There's cover by the mountain, and there's an opening in the north that when winds start funneling through, it becomes violent. And the storm they met, Peter knew that they could die. You know, life happens that way, guys. You know, we think when we are victorious, 
we make a mistake to think that victory will last forever. It doesn't. When you hit the rock bottom, you think that you hit the rock bottom rest of your life. Well, that's not true either. You always have up and downs in life, expect it. So in this time, Peter, freaking out with the rest of his disciples, friend, and, and there are some tax collectors, and there are other guys that, that does not know ocean or the lake, so big that it felt like an ocean. And then they see a man walking. You know the story. And they thought, surely must be a ghost. Ghost. But here's the familiar voice. No, it is I. I am Christ. I am Jesus. And Peter cries out, Lord, if it is you, let me walk up to you. You see, Peter always has to be the first one to speak. Let me walk up to you, Jesus. And Jesus said, come on. Come on. And what happens? He was the first man in entire human history who walked on water. Wow. You know, I, someday when I go to heaven, I would like to meet Peter, and I would like to ask him, how did it feel, man? How did it feel like walk on water right next to Jesus? Wow, it would have been far out. It would have been so wonderful. And yet, when he was walking, looking at Jesus, he was fine until he started looking at the waves. Oh. Uh, Wow, what a powerful worship song today. Make me, you make me brave. See, I'm sure Peter, as was walking out, he began to see his fellow brothers, you know, all scared in the boat, right? And he's probably t telling himself, see, I'm the favored one. See, I'm different than you guys, you chicken. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm different than you because I'm walking on water, guys. All right, talk about bread rights. I mean, who could say that? Yeah, have you walked on water? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, every time I go East Coast and they, you know, I don't know why East Coast people, you know, they, the moment I find out I'm from L.A., like, how do you live there? So dangerous. And all them like, yeah, but do you have In-N-Out Burger, man? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just shut them down. It's like, <laughs> They don't have In-N-Out Burger, so we're doing better, you know. And, and so we're competing and comparing, and it's like, he never walked on water, man. And, but as soon as he felt focusing on himself, not focused on Christ, he began to see the surroundings. And he started falling. And he cries out, God, save me. Jesus, save me. Wow. Immediately, Matthew 14, 31, immediately, Jesus reaches out his hand and cut him. And then he says, you of little faith, he said. What? This is Peter. What? I am full of faith. I walked on water. What about those guys? They are the one who's without faith. Why do you pick on me, Jesus? I walked on water. Sometimes that's how I feel. Like, really? You accuse me of without faith? Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I travel? And didn't I plan? And didn't I leprous colony? And, and all, all this crazy stuff, Lord. You, I'm without faith. And then he says, why did you doubt why did you doubt? Wow. See, when you look that word in original text in Hebrew, oh, I'm sorry, in Greek, it means to hesitate. It was so profound, and there's no response on this side, so I'm going to say it this side. Okay. <laughs> the word doubt in Greek is hesitate. Because, <laughs> you know, people say, I. I'm, I'm full of faith. But then why are you hesitating? Will you believe that God is with you? 
and you believe and you've been walking with God for so many years. This message is not for beginners. This is for people who have been following Christ for many, many decades and feel like, but Lord, why? Why am I seeing the fruit? Why am I, you know, honestly compared to those guys who goof around and they don't really live for God or they don't really go to church and they don't even give tithe and offering and they don't do anything, Jack. But it seems like they're doing better than me, God. They just bought a brand new Tesla, God. <laughs> Not only that, they invest in Tesla when did IPO. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that, you know? And how come I always get the bad part of the deal? And you fret over people who succeed and it seems like you are the one who deserve that. There is a consequence in following Christ and you should be prosperity, you know, like why, why children don't even go to church, God? And I'm, I'm sick and I find out that I am, my loved one is sick with disease and cancer and why is this thing happening to me? And you find yourself hesitating, not fully engaged, not giving everything you've got to God, like you used to, like you used to. Peter, you find him, what? I'm doubting, but I'm the one who walk on water, Lord. I'm the one who walk on water. You know, a great philosopher named Martin Buber who wrote a book called I and Thou. How many of you actually know a book called I and Thou by Martin Buber? Raise your hand. It's okay. I'm not going to penalize you. Only my wife. <laughs> Only my wife knows the book I and Thou. My goodness. You all need to repent. <laughs> Go to Amazon.com tonight and order a book I and Thou by Martin Buber. It will not cost you extra time, I guarantee. Because you're going to put that Bible, not Bible, that book into, in your bathroom. So you don't, you're not going to waste any time. Right? And uh, uh, yeah, you just, a little bit of time, just read. It's written in small chapters, you know. You could read probably within three months, you know. And if you are the one with constipation in two months, you know, because you'll spend longer time. And so... But read that book. It changed my life completely. I and thou, Martin Buber. He wrote this. He said, if there were a devil, you would not be the one who decided against God, but one who in eternity came to no decision. There's no responding. This side once again, so I'm going to. <laughs> I warned you already. OK. Martin Buber wrote, if there were a devil, you would not be one who decided against God, but one who in eternity came to no decision. <laughs> See, it's as evil to never decide for God. And says, someday, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I know, I know, Pastor, I know I need to serve God and I need to give but I need to give up my life for God and I need to take up my cross daily and I need to die to myself, but maybe not today. Wow. See, in Matthew 10, 11, 10 1, Jesus already called Peter. Matthew 10, 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples, apostles to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. See, God called his disciple to himself. See, we think calling is like, oh, God called me to be an apostle. God called me to be a teacher. God called me to be a businessman. Well, that is a calling too, aspect of calling. But here, it's very clear when Jesus calls, he calls people to himself. Come near to me and I'll go near to you. You know that scripture, James 8, 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. James is getting it. 
See, calling is so clear that we need to be intimate with God. And when you are intimate with God, then you begin to understand the heart of God. God does not give you command. God gives you intimacy, and out of the heartbeat, you begin to understand. How would Pastor Ross know, right? Did you say you're at a store called Ross or Avance? I thought you said I was at Ross. I'm like, wow. you know, Avance, okay. I love Ross, you know. Let's go there all the time. Tuesday is senior discount, 10%. So... Why am I saying? Okay, so, <laughs> so he's. You may have stood in that line, and you may God may have asked you to just pray for somebody next to you, right? But maybe because you're so far away from God, when God called you to next to Him, so that He could whisper in your ears. Or he was shouting at you. But a lot of times, we're so busy, sometimes serving God, that we don't hear from God. He says, I called you. I brought you to me. And then I gave you what? Authority. Wow. Far out. Right? We have authority that God gives. That it's so hard to explain. It's, it's, it's kind of supernatural. You know, some of the stuff that God asks you to do, and, and you just kind of do it, and then while you're doing it, you have all kinds of doubts. <laughs> Why am I doing this? It's kind of nonsense. It's crazy. Lord, really? I have to do this? Right. We moved to our house in Cerritos, year 2000. So 24 years ago, we moved to this new location, and and about half a mile distance, there's a fantastic burger place that right across there, <laughs> there is, uh, is it Fantastic Burger Hunt or is it? Galaxy Burger, Galaxy Burger on Al Alondra and whatever. And, and Galaxy Burger, and they have fantastic pastrami sandwich. And right across in the other side was Presbyterian Theological Seminary in America, PTSA. And it's been there for 24 years. But I, you know, and, and some of my mentor, uh, who was pastor of large church, uh, Yongnak Church in K-Town, and, and he's been telling me, Bob, you need to go and help them out and teach there. And I'm like, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. But, well, 24 years passed, and he passed away. And so, um, and one morning, the Holy Spirit says, why don't you go visit the school? Just like that. Right? I said, well, Lord, really? And I so happened that I met someone who teaches there a week prior, and he gave me his name card. So I thought, okay, I'll try. I texted him. I said, brother, uh, can I go visit your school? <laughs> Are you there now? He said, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm here. Can you come? I said, oh, okay. I, I, I could walk there, actually. <laughs> it's 0.5 miles. So I got there, and he said, and it, was, it was a pretty legit, it was large seminary, and, and he said, oh, Pastor oh, the chancellor of the school is here. Why don't you go say hi to him? I said, no, I don't want to see chancellor. I just want to see you and see the school. And, and he said, oh, no, no, I think it would be nice you, you talk to him. I said, okay. So I go there and meet him, and the chancellor says, found out I'm from Cambodia, or work at Cambodia. Oh, my academic mentor is Professor Lee, I said, oh, he's my buddy. Actually, we teach at the same seminary. He goes, wow, you, you work with my academic mentor. Immediately, I got credential from him. <laughs> and he said, why don't you come and teach at my school? I said, well, because I travel so much that I probably cannot, on site, I cannot do it. Matter of fact, you know, uh, after, th after this, Wednesday, I'll be taking an airplane to go to Korea, then back to Cambodia, and next time I see you will be February 2025. I'm so sad. Happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you. <laughs> so, I'll see you in February next year, but 
But they said, oh, no, no. Uh, uh, we, we have a PhD program that you could just mentor. And, and I'm like, oh, wow, that would be nice. Through that connection. Now the PhD department, three professors met me, were having a meal. And they said, sir, well, you know, I, I see that you produced, you published a lot of books. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just using ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people think it's hard, but dude, I published 30 books this year, so it's not that hard, you know. So, and I mostly textbooks for the seminary. And so, well, how do you do that? I'm like, why? Well, as a seminary, we're going through a struggle how to make a, a standard in which, because students are now using ChatGPT, turning papers. I taught a course, 70 students. Everybody turned in 12 to 15 page paper, that means I read 1,000 pages. And you know what? Some of them just pure ChatGPT <laughs> writing. Because <laughs> I use so much, I know what ChatGPT sounds like. <laughs> so I got, gave them instant F. I got F to a lot of students this year. You use ChatGPT without qualifying it, you get F. You need to credit saying that I use ChatGPT. You know, and these are my thoughts, and I just use it, you know. Are you using it as a tool, or is ChatGPT using you? You know, it's legal, but it's ethical. So, and the professor says, sir, why don't you, can you teach us on that? Can you do a special lecture? I'm like, next week? Oh, well, I'll be traveling through, because I have to go to Georgia, I, I have to go to Chicago, and I did a revival, and came back from Chicago, and. Day after, I had to go to Georgia, and, and, and day after, they want me to do a lecture. I said, okay, but if I do lecture, I would like to write a book on how to write you know, a book through ChatGPT. So I promised that. So two weeks went by. I was in Chicago. I was in Atlanta, retreat. During retreat, in three days, I wrote a 250-page textbook on how to use ChatGPT to publish. It's like, wow. You know, while I'm doing it, I'm like, this is nonsense. This is crazy. I don't know why I'm doing this, right? So here I am, show up at their seminary, and 10 professors, and Zoom, everybody Zoomed all over the world, and I'm teaching them how to do ChatGPT publication and how to make your paper, academic paper, legal and ethical. And the response was totally crazy. They went berserk. They, they want to make that as a standard. They want me to teach a course. And, and they offered me a position, a PhD student advisor. And, and you know, honestly, I came home, scratched my head, like, this is nonsense. <laughs> this is crazy, right? I walked on water. And then all this fear, all this doubt, start coming in. You know, some of you have been serving God, following God, and you are now in a place of hesitation. You don't know, go all out. You know, I want you to know that Jesus never rebuked. Jesus, matter of fact, said, on your faith, on what you've done, and what you confessed, I'm going to build my church. I, I pray that the family of Catalyst will find yourself not hesitating, not doubting, <laughs> because then you will live through life of delay. Because when you doubt, when you hesitate, then your life is extended, suspended, and you go through delay, a place called Haran, where Abraham had to get out of. You know, I just finished my commentary on Psalms, and I was so blessed, especially Psalm 23rd. You know, I didn't know. I've been Christians for 45 years. But when King David cried out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word shepherd in Hebrew is a verb. So powerful, right? <laughs> you know, when I read that, I said, really? 
Lord is my shepherd is participle, masculine singular, construct, a verb. So King David is not saying, Lord is my shepherd. He's saying, my God is shepherding me now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. My mighty God is shepherding me now. Wow, what a difference, right? If shepherd's a noun, it's okay, uh, shepherds do shepherding, and I guess shepherds shepherding me. No, King David said, the Lord, you are shepherding me now, and I lack nothing. See, King David wrote Psalm 21. Psalm 21, read it. It says, oh God, God, you are so good. You ask, I don't even ask these things. You crown me with golden crown. God, you are super God. I love you, I love you, I love you, I praise you. Psalm 22, it says, oh my God, I am worse than a worm. Why do you leave me? This utterance of Jesus on the cross. Why do you forsake me, oh God? From Psalm 21, Psalm 22, Finally move on to Psalm 23rd. Lord, I may go through a tough time, up and downs in my life, but Lord, you are shepherding me now. And that settles it. I am content. What leg do I have? Knowing that you are shepherding me now, today, not yesterday, not tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. But you are shepherding me today, God. And I'm content. And I will walk with you. You know, what an awesome testimony Peter could have had if he did not look at the waves, and if he did not fall to the water, but just standing next to, bring the rope. Come on, Jesus, let's go to the other side and walk on water. Woo, that would be a wonderful gospel. I pray that you will find our Lord Jesus shepherding you nurturing you, taking care of you today. That you will not rely on yesterday's faith or future faith. You will rely on him today. And do not hesitate, do not doubt, do not fall. Go under the water. Jesus will not rebuke you. Jesus said, faithful and good servant, I'll build the church catalyst on the faith that you have demonstrated as you obey. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for life that we could live for you. Some of us have been following you many, many years, and some of us really are in place of hesitation. Not, not doubting you completely, but is this for real? Am I, am I going to finish well? I remember when I encountered Jesus first time 45 years ago. My, my world changed upside down. Some of you experienced encountering Holy Spirit and now your testimony of how, how your life is never the same again. But oftentimes, including myself, I, I find myself hesitating. Why don't I go all out? What prevents me from just giving everything I've got and my future and, and just be all out for God again? And some of us were wounded by some misfortune or something that we claimed in faith didn't work out the way we thought, and, and children got in the way, and, or even health, and some of you went through a hard time, and uh, bankruptcy, maybe being laid off, and it was worth sharing, and, and then you begin to wonder, Lord, can I really trust you? Can I really give everything I've got to you again? And be in that love relationship, God, intimate relationship. Oh, if that's you, would you just put your hand to your heart right now? 
Just go ahead. God, I want brand new heart, God. I don't want this broken heart to be fixed. I'm tired of fixing my broken heart, God. God, give me a brand new heart. It was so pure, so innocent, so simple. Jesus, I loved you, and I want to do everything in my power to serve you. Then why life got so complicated? With competing and comparing, it seems like the others got better deal than me. And I thought, I'm the making all the sacrifices. I'm the one who has so fervently pursued you, but Father, why? If that's you, oh God, would you grant us a brand new heart as we lay our hands, the blood of Jesus to come and cleanse it, soak it, change it, transform it. Only Jesus, you could do that. Holy Spirit, God, only you could touch it. We would like to do it again. Go to the place of innocence. Go to the place of walking out in faith. Walk on waves. Walk on water. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Would you put those two hands to your head? Cover your head. God, would you come? Fill our minds with your spirit. We've been just dumping so much world, so much junk, so much garbage, Lord, to this mind. Renew our mind, O oh God. Fill us, Lord God. Fill us. They will be renewed. They will look at the world differently. We'll look at our spouse differently. We'll look at our children differently. We'll have, be full of faith, Lord, knowing that your will be done, God, and we'll not hesitate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Would you lift those hands to the sky in sign of dedication? God, here I come. I'll go near to you, Holy Spirit. God. Come near. The fastest way for God to come to you is cry out to God. Just like an infant that does not move will bring mom and dad so quickly to him. You want to be near to God? Cry out to God in your private chamber or bedroom or prayer room. Desperately seek after God and say, God, I need you. God, I'm so desperately in need of you. There's nothing I can do without you, God. And weep over those things that you've been crying out after. The Lord will come near to you. God will answer you. God would walk with you. God would call you faithful and good servant. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you, O oh God. We give you glory. Lord, make us brave. They will step out. Hallelujah. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's Thank you so much for joining us for our online service. Hope you will join us in person sometime. It'll be great to see you and meet you. Don't forget to subscribe to our Catalyst YouTube channel so you don't miss out on anything. And be blessed this week. And as always, thank you, Jesus.